Hi everyone, I'm Todd Shepard, the investigative reporter with Broad and Liberty based in Philadelphia, and we're very happy to have you with us and watching us today, where we're going to go in depth on the question of the Electoral College versus the idea of a national popular vote or a national popular vote interstate compact. And we also want to look at this last idea, the idea of a national popular vote through a Republican lens. Is there actually a Republican advantage maybe in moving away from the traditional winner-take-all method that we've seen through the Electoral College through the centuries and actually moving over to a national popular vote interstate compact, which again, slowly has kept its momentum through these last 10 years. We will set a little bit more of this table in just a minute, but for right now, we'd like to uh, just introduce the couple of other gentlemen that we have with us. We're very fortunate to have with us today. Uh, let them introduce themselves uh, so that you know, so you'll know who we are talking with and uh, understand their background as we continue to, to debate this subject today. So we start on my left, uh, Mr. Sean Parnell from Save Our States. So Sean, give us the 30 seconds to one minute biography of you and your organization and, and what you're all about. Sure, uh, Save Our States is an organization that was founded specifically to uh, work against the National Popular Vote Compact, which we think is uh, just a bad idea and we'll be getting into that later. Uh, I've been working on this issue for about a decade. Uh, before that, I've worked primarily with free market think tanks for Republican uh, elected officials and have about 25 years working in, in this area. To my right, Mr. Patrick Rosenstiel. Um, Patrick, uh, again, like Sean, has uh, a lot of bona fides on the right of center sphere. Give us a little bit of your background, and uh, you are a senior consultant with the National Popular Vote. Yeah, that's right, uh, and grateful for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I guess uh, if we're going on conservative bona fides, uh, one of the reasons that I'm uh, a proponent for the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact is because I've been a conservative uh, my whole life trapped behind the blue wall in Minnesota, right? The only state that voted for Walter Mondale. So, um, you know, to me, uh, my background is in American electoral politics. I uh, worked to realign Congress and hold it for the Republicans back in the day. Uh, been around American presidents, um, ran statewide ballot initiatives, and, um, you know, served the Bush administration outside the White House with Progress for America in support of uh, domestic and foreign policy agendas of, uh, of the Bush administration. Um, yeah, my entire life has been um, sort of dedicated to carrying water for the elephant uh, and, um, you know, trying to stay focused on conservative candidates and conservative causes. Let's hang off yeah. on, hold off on that, because I, I think I want to have a little bit longer discussion on that. So let's just, Sean, I mean, in terms of, in terms of lawsuits happening, I mean, again, it, is the fact that we've never seen a lawsuit in any single state that has joined the compact yet, is it your understanding that essentially those lawsuits have yet to, to materialize because the issue's not ripe until the 270 threshold's passed? Yeah, that's right. Um, and, and once that uh, 270 threshold, if it ever is passed, uh, there will be litigation in every state, uh, not only challenging its constitutionality under the U.S. Constitution, and I, I, I always say that I think it's a mistake to predict exactly how the U.S. Supreme Court is going to rule on anything. anything sure. I think everybody's been kind of surprised at one point or another, but there are some very serious arguments against the constitutionality of the National Popular Vote Compact. Pat okay, so has let's... read the same law professors writing these articles that I have, I assume. Yeah, uh, I it, found it, many of them it, credible. It, well, so like, what, okay, what are the, uh, you've, what you've, are the arguments is what I'd love to hear. I don't think that the compact cause is really where the biggest weakness is for the National Popular Vote Compact, though. The fact is, what National Popular Vote proposes to do is essentially the, the member states are seizing control of the presidential election process. And they are saying, we are going to dictate how the president is elected. There's a majority of electors, if the compact is in effect, they control. And that means that a state that doesn't conform their election process to the way national popular vote requires, they're effectively locked out. Uh, and that, I think, is where you're going to have trouble. Like I said, I'm not going to predict. My, my crystal ball is maybe not as good as Patrick's uh, on which way the Supreme Court is going to go, but I think that the fact that the compact has the ability to effectively exclude some states that aren't members from the presidential election process, that is going to be a problem. If the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact is in effect, 
right? And every voter, so first of all, it would include every voter in every state, right? Every individual voter in every state would have direct impact on a slate of elect, 270 electoral votes, right? Their vote would have direct effect on that, and if their candidate won, those electors would be the one that swore in. So the idea that national popular vote excludes voters in states from presidential elections, that's exactly false. That is kind of the current system if you live in a flyover state versus a battleground state. What national popular vote does is it ensures that every voter in every state is politically relevant in every presidential election, which I think is in the best interest of the country, best interest of my state, and best interest of the conservative movement in America. That's my personal opinion and why I'm here today. What I will say is that if the national popular vote interstate compact is in place and there are 270 or more electoral votes in it, the candidate who gets the most popular votes in all 50 states and the District of Columbia, as reported by those states, is gonna be the candidate that wins the presidency. And if that compact is in effect, in effect, and let's just say Virginia decides they wanna to go to the long format, right, ballot, basically what Virginia would be doing is saying, we don't wanna have a voice in presidential elections, and I don't think that's gonna happen in Virginia or any other state. Now the idea that any state has any standing to sue another state over how they award electors, I fundamentally reject that. Pat is correct that the, uh, there is no right or ability under the current system for one state to sue another because of its electoral practices. However, what National Popular Vote Compact creates is potentially, and, and again, this all depends on how the Supreme Court looks at things, but it creates a situation where the voting practices in Maine with ranked choice voting are very clearly going to affect how Pennsylvania, if it's a member of the compact, is awarding its electors. Uh, and, and real quickly to follow up on what Pat said about Maine solving the problem, uh, what they did doesn't actually solve the problem. It actually locks in a different problem, which is that uh, if you're just using the final votes, then if a candidate uh, or Democrat or a Republican ever finishes in third place in a state with ranked choice voting, which happened in 1992 uh, in, with Ross Perot, not ranked choice voting, but where a candidate finished in third place, Ross Perot finished in second place in Maine and in Utah, what you wind up doing is literally zeroing out votes. If you ever have a Republican candidate or a Democratic candidate finish in third place in a state with ranked choice voting, then you are literally going to watch hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of votes be completely erased once national popular vote member states have to try and figure out which vote totals are we going to be using? Let me say that the Maine legislature, the governor in Maine, and the secretary of state in Maine all believe that national popular vote and uh, RCV can sort of coexist in a very real fashion. So I find them more credible than the critiques. Um, the idea that votes get zeroed out, that's exactly the problem with the current system, that votes get zeroed out in every state, particularly voters in flyover states are totally and routinely ignored. So you always want to talk about some perceived, um, you know, sort of structural. I, I mean, at the end of the day, we got we got a we got a system right now where voters in three out of four states are ignored, right? Where the candidate with the most votes doesn't win, and where every voter in every state is not equally valued. So, um, y you know, I, I think the leading organizations for ranked choice voting support a national popular vote for president. They certainly believe they can coexist. What would be the Republican case for moving to the national popular vote if the if the GOP seems like it has has been so far from it in the last 20 years and the only way they've obtained the presidency is through the electoral college? Is there a way that moving to the compact actually gives them kind of a, a schematic uh, advantage it, even if not this year, well, then, you know, years yeah. down the road. I, I mean, I think, I, I think there's a structural advantage to the other party under the current system, notwithstanding the detail that you share. I mean, I think the 2016 and 2000 elections could have turned out very differently. And I actually believe that every election would turn out differently if we ran under a national popular vote system. I mean, the, the real critique of the current system is that um, uh, candidates are incentivized to focus on just a handful of battleground states, right? And the rest of the country is treated like flyover. Um, so if you change the incentive to campaign, a uh, great example, in the year 2000, uh, um, 
more money was spent in the battleground state of Florida to win it by 527 popular votes than 42 other states combined. Does, is that campaign money or does that include law l lawsuit money as well? Well, that is campaign money and it's, you know, the events correspond the same way. I mean, there 38 states were totally ignored in general election events, for example, and this money corresponds. Um, so if you have a national popular vote for president, both of the major parties or all of the parties that have a candidate for president are gonna be campaigning in all 50 states in the District of Columbia, which you can see how that would change turnout in these presidential elections. Um, so I think the real political case for a national popular vote for president, at least um, from a conservative idea standpoint, is what we would do is turn a presidential campaign into a first past the post system, you know, just like every election in America, right? first past the post system where the candidate with the most votes wins, right? And I think that would set us up to not get transactional, right? Uh, with battleground state voters, but focus on sort of a, a center right candidate with a center right message to a center right country. And, and at the end of the day, I'm not afraid of our ideas. Um, I will say that uh, one, I, I kind of feel like it should be beside the point whether national popular vote or the electoral college as it works today uh, benefits Republicans or Democrats. Um, I, I'm not a fan of ch making a fundamental change to how our politics works, how our elections work, because maybe peering through the crystal ball, we might think that it benefits my party. I, I just I fundamentally think that that is a terrible way to approach this issue. Uh, that said, I don't think that either system necessarily benefits one party over the other. Uh, I think that what the Electoral College today, uh, which you know could probably use a few tweaks here and there, um, I think Pat's got some valid gripes about winner take all, uh, but the Electoral College today benefits the party that is best able to build a broad and diverse coalition across the entire country. And my concern is that under national popular vote, you wind up incentivizing candidates to focus on major metropolitan areas where they're able to leverage candidate visits and attention, policy, ad spending, and maybe most importantly, turnout operations. It's a lot easier to turn out the vote in major metropolitan areas than it is in rural areas. And I just have a concern as somebody who grew up in a rural area that national popular vote leaves a lot of those areas out. That's, as far as the, the issue of transactional politics, I, I feel like you know the, the claim is that we can get politics out of politics, and I just I don't see that happening. You know, Pat's argument is that the Bush administration uh, embraced the Medicare Part B prescription D, Part D prescription drug program uh, in order to win Florida. Uh, one, I don't know that there's actually any evidence of this. I've heard this claim for a decade. I've never actually seen any evidence of it. But second, even if he is correct that that is what happened. What he is assuming is that a, a Bush White House, Karl Rove, is smart enough to figure out that, gee, a Medicare drug program that's really going to help us with the seniors in Florida, that they're smart enough to figure that out, but it would never occur to them that, you know, gee, maybe a, a Medicare prescription drug program is going to help us with senior citizens across the entire country who are, you know, the most likely to turn out. Uh, you know, I, I just, I find that you know, th there is some transactional politics that goes on and that's unfortunate, but I just don't see uh, national popular vote doing anything to diminish that. And in fact, you know, I suspect that it's cheaper to try and buy off a small group of voters in one state than it is the entire country. So I, I just don't see national popular votes addressing that issue. One of the things that Sean brought up uh, and, and we had on our rundown of, of topics that we wanted to make sure we got into is whenever I've talked about this with people or politicians, lawyers, whomever, um, it is always one of the first two or three rebuttals to the idea of the national po popular vote interstate compact is this turns the elections back over to municipal areas. Essentially, Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, uh, the Miami Beach, and so forth, they are so dense that essentially the coastal 
you know, the, the, the megalopolises, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, you know, will, will essentially be the dominant force in the election factors, or the dominant factor in the election determinant, and that, uh, yes, as he mentioned, you know, the, the person in Topeka, Kansas is, is, I don't want to say they're weaker because obviously one vote compares to one vote, but uh, they're living in a less dense part of the country and politicians will focus their campaign campaigns on dense areas because that's where they get the most bang for the buck. I'll say under the current system that a voter in Topeka, Kansas is far weaker than a voter in South Florida, right? But because it, Florida is a battleground state. The idea that the current system forces us to build the broad coalition suggests that we don't watch campaigns and how they operate under the current system. I mean, the truth is, is under the current system, voters hunker down in 12 battleground states and ignore 38 states in the general election. I mean, it's almost impossible not to accept that premise. And if you don't accept that premise, then the current system's working great, okay? I don't know a lot of people who can point to the current system as if it's working great. You even see it requires a few tweaks. So I'd be interested off camera talking about some of those. Um, the reason I know that rural voters aren't gonna get ignored under a national popular vote for president vis-a-vis -vis urban centers. Is that the question? Yes, sir. Okay, so the reason I know that is because when you add up the population in the top 100 cities in this country, it's 59.8 million people, which corresponds to a similar number of voters. When I add up the population in rural America, according to the U.S. Census, it's 59.4 million people. Now, the reason I know that a national popular vote will put rural voters at parity with urban voters is because every voter in every state is going to matter to the national popular vote outcome. And while it's a cute soundbite and it's an honest question, you know what I mean? It happens to be not true based on sort of the demographic detail of the country. One of the reasons I'm a proponent of the national popular vote is because every rural voter will be relevant in the national popular vote outcome. I believe it's good for rural voters, whereas now the most rural states are flyover states and ignored by American presidents. And if you don't believe that presidents pay attention to the issues that are important to battleground state and ignore the issues that are important to flyover states, I don't think you pay attention. What's so objectionable about every voter in every state being politically relevant and expanding this principle, like actually applying the principle of one person, one vote, which is foundational to our republic, to presidential elections? I mean, why are you so afraid of your idea? I mean, at the end of the day, I'm not afraid of my ideas. I believe my ideas resonate with the majority of the American people. I think you and I share a lot of ideas and I'm not afraid to take them to the American people win and have the full faith and confidence of the American voters behind our presidents so that we can govern with mandates and not sort of defend our legitimacy every day we're in the White House. Undoubtedly, national popular vote would change the way people campaign. I think it's difficult to predict what the exact outcomes uh, will be, but I, I do want to push back on the idea that there's as many you know, metropolitan voters as there are rural voters, because if you look at the 100, actually it's 104 largest metropolitan areas in the country, those with half a million people or more, uh, that comes to 225 million people. That's more than two thirds of the, of the populace. Uh, you know, candidates are going to go where they can leverage their time, where they can leverage their advertising, uh, their, um, their policy, and their turnout operations. So I, I think we just have a, a, you know, a disagreement on what the outcome of that is, is likely to be. I think campaigns are going to be very efficient and rational and go where they think they can be, you know, get the, the most bang for their buck. I, I just think that it's a mistake to only see frankly, the benefits touted for NPV and not really look at what we're going to be doing to the entire country and the way candidates campaign. Uh, I don't think it's fair to say that, that the campaigns completely ignore those so-called flyover states. What they actually do is they lock down a lot of those very easily. I don't look at the Joe Biden administration and say, boy, he's completely going against what those California Democrats want. I didn't see Donald Trump's administration, you know, really sticking it to Texas in their policies. Uh, you know, candidates on both sides have their agendas and their agendas line up with certain states. That's just a fact. And what winds up happening, as I see it, is one, not only do these campaigns first go to most states around the country when they're trying to get the primary, you, you know, win the, the nomination, 
but they also lock down these states by being in alignment with them before they go to the, the, the so-called battleground states. If your sole metric of if your state is being paid attention to and, and getting something out of the presidency is, has Air Force One landed in my state, then, you know, maybe Pat's got a point. But there are a lot of different ways in which the White House and, and the presidential campaigns pay attention to a lot of states. No, I, I mean, the Electoral College doesn't protect any state from any other state because electoral votes get commingled. But the idea that the current system resists litigation is almost laughable or provides some sort of... No, no I, I mean, at the end of the day, how many lawsuits were there in Arizona and how much litigation was there in Arizona in the last presidential election? Some of it's still being litigated, right? right. Because it came down to 10,000 votes. So in 2000, in a national popular vote election that comes down to 550,000 votes, there wouldn't be room for a ton of litigation. You wouldn't need to litigate. I think what most people don't understand is that the average change of vote in a statewide recount from 2000 to 2012 was 294 votes. That's in a statewide recount. There isn't a single presidential election, with all due respect to the scholar, that would have been within the confines of what a legitimate recount would be under a national popular vote system. So the system that results in litigation is the current system. When states like Arizona come down to 11,000 popular votes, or in Florida where 527 popular votes are separating the two candidates, uh, there was no shortage of litigation in that year. So what national popular vote does is it makes recounts less likely. It makes litigation less necessary. I think fewer courts will be picking presidents and f more voters will be deciding the outcome of races. And I believe every voter in every state will be relevant in a presidential election. And again, this idea that one person, one vote governing presidential elections is some sort of extreme democratic idea in our republic is re re there's not a single redeeming quality to the state-based winner-take-all law. It doesn't protect us from anything. As a matter of fact, it creates false crises that lead to constitutional crises. And if you don't believe that, go talk to somebody in a diner and ask them how they think the current system is working. You know, at the end of the day, nobody trusts the results in presidential elections anymore. And it's because we got to worry about how Philadelphia is treating votes in a battleground state or Arizona, Phoenix is treating uh, votes in Arizona or how Atlanta is dumping ballots in the middle of the night in Georgia. So the idea that the current system protects us from that is foundationally not credible and laughable, in, in, in my opinion. Sean, your response to that? Yeah, so a couple things. And I do want to touch on that one person, one vote comment. This is our last, uh, this is our last topic here, so we've right, got I'll to just wrap say, it up. One person, one vote is an important democratic principle. It is not the only democratic principle. Federalism, checks and balances are other important principles as well. Uh, I do think that, you know, there's litigation under the current system. I think that you would have much more litigation under this because right now a problem in New York, which, for example, seems to habitually leave tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of votes off of its certificate of ascertainment, uh, you know, there's going to be litigation over whether, a, you know, member states need to accept vote totals from other states that are known to be inaccurate. Uh, they still argue over who won the 1960 presidential election. It's not clear whether Kennedy or Nixon received the most votes. And, uh, you know, it's sort of a historical triviality right now because Kennedy very clearly won the Electoral College. If you have that similar type of situation where New York is missing a couple hundred thousand votes from its report, uh, under ranked choice voting, states are literally erasing hundreds of thousands of votes for one candidate or another, uh, you're going to have that type of litigation under national popular vote. And as bad as 2020 was, it's nothing compared to what happens when uh, every secretary of state is being sued over whether they chose to use the final ranked choice voting numbers or the initial ranked choice voting numbers, because that uh, main law did not fix the problem. And in fact, you mentioned the leading ranked choice voting uh, organization in the country, a group called Fair Vote. Uh, their leader actually put out a 64-page paper about this very problem and the congressional legislation or the additional compact that would be needed to fix the problems. Now, I'll say it doesn't actually, what he proposes doesn't actually fix the problem, but 
uh, you know, the, the idea that this has all been taken care of is just flat out false. There are serious problems and it's going to make its way into litigation because the vote totals cannot be conclusively determined in a close election if you have the sort of things that are going to happen. So if the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact is in effect, and there are states with 270 electoral votes, which means states with 75 more electoral votes join us, join us, and I think it's a matter of when and not if, then I think everybody should read the compact, right? Because the compact says the chief election official of each member state shall treat as conclusive an official statement containing the number of popular votes in a state for each presidential slate made by the day established by federal law for making a state's final determination conclusive. That's called the safe harbor date. Now, New York has made very clear that they would make every, do everything in their effort to have a final determination of their vote prior to the safe harbor date, or else they'd be disenfranchising their own voters, right? And so I think, you know, I think Sean, with all, and nothing but love for Sean, right? Smart guy, a lot going on. I think sometimes he misreads the compact, he misreads federal law, or he misreads state law to traffic in what I believe in some ways is not real information to confuse people. At the end of the day, the chief election official of each member state is going to be, is, has to accept the statement of the final determination of every other state that has the, 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 the ability to, to, to vote in presidential elections. And those states will rush to make their totals final prior to that safe harbor date. Gentlemen, thank you both. He has been Patrick Rosenstiel with uh, National Popular Vote and on my left, Sean Parnell with Save Our States. We are very happy that you've been able to join us for this time. Uh, we, if you aren't catching this on TV, we certainly expect to have this up on other streaming uh, locations like YouTube later. And we want to say thanks very much to both our participants for giving up their time, not just here to be with us in the studio, but to make the travel accommodations and everything they did to have to be with us today. We're very proud to bring you this discussion. Uh, it's one of the first video reports of this kind that first of many that we hope to be able to bring you from Broad and Liberty. So uh, additionally, not only will you be able to find this video later at our website, broadandliberty.com, but we will also have uh, op-eds that we will be hosting from both these gentlemen uh, that will be companion pieces that will also have some other links, of course, for more information to you if you're interested in learning more about uh, the Electoral College or the National Popular Vote Interstate, Com Interstate Compact. Thanks so much for your attention throughout this entire debate. We hope it's been fun for you. We know it has been for us. We really appreciate, pre appreciate you watching, and we look forward to seeing you on our next video report.